Thank you, children. You may continue with your school. And a very good morning to all of you. I bring, you can see on the screen which letter part, you can see that my mother has also joined today. So I bring greetings from my family to yours. I also bring greetings from uh, brethren from North to all of you. And it is so good to be back with you all just after last week. And I hope the word of God and the fellowship that you have received and enjoyed during the convention is helping you to be a better vessel of honor for God. Now, in my last semester of GCS studies, that is the Grace Communion uh, Seminary Studies, I took the course called Missional Living, a class that was led by Dr. Charles Fleming, who happens to be a very good close friend of Pastor Dan and his brother Bobby. And I was, as I was conversing with him, I expressed the desire to share what I was learning in that course as a series of sermon with you all. And he was so excited and happy that he has extended all the help that is needed in this case. And as a part of that, I always wanted to deliver the start of my series in person so I can give it an appropriate start. And I thank God that it happened during the convention where I could just give it a good kickoff for our missional living. And now <clears throat> you will see that throughout my sermon series, I will refer to the lecture notes and book that I have referred during the course. And now since I'm going to cover this vast subject through the sermon series, and know that sermon has a limited time that I can bring things to you, I would also share the notes with you all over a period of week. This could be some of the important points or the points that I wanted to cover, but could not due to limitation of time. And that I will share with you all over WhatsApp group to ponder. So let me share my screen and we will start. Yeah. Perfect. So let's start with the recap of what I covered from my last sermon. We have seen that the our God is a missional God. He sent his son to redeem humanity with himself by the spirit. We have also seen that it is not the church that established the mission, runs the mission, but it is the very mission that has the church. That means the very purpose and identity of the church is through the mission of God. We have also seen that often we as a vessel, we go and rely on our appearance and our functions and thus we belittle ourselves. But we have seen that we are not just normal vessel. We are made for a special purpose. We are made holy and we are made useful for our master to use us for good work. Then we have also seen that mission begins with the internal transformation first. It does not begin with a set of programs that you take from your church, go execute it. No, it has to come from within like a flowing of a living water. And we have seen that the living water refers to the very Holy Spirit working in us and transforming us. Then I covered three practical actions in my last uh, sermon. The first was about preparation. That is Cultivating the living water in our life. I'll just start my timer. Yeah. First is about preparing ourselves. How do we cultivate the very living water in our lives? Then we have seen how does the mission starts where you are. That is at your home. In your family and around your family. And then we have seen mission flows from your daily life, the very things that you do day in, day out. Now, there is a bigger problem when it comes to mission. 
Now, what happens is, although we have a good heart, all of us, we want to live a very generous life. We want to live hospitable. We want to be led by the Spirit. We want to live like Christ as missionaries to our own neighborhoods. In short, we want to live out our faith in the open for everyone to see. But as easy as it sounds, it is not the same because the understanding and the implementation of various churches, it differs. Now, some churches has a policy that every member need to know and memorize the gospel presentation and they have to go forth and share the gospel with anyone who would listen. And this is also what happens when we invite the missionaries and we see their, their testimonies of how they share the, the, the gospel use over a tea or just a conversation or when they were traveling or back of a paper, how they uh, moved it in the marketplace. But the, but the challenge is, many of us, it can be very difficult. It can be very daunting and challenging task. And because of the variety of reasons. Why? Because some of us might not be as good as in engaging dialogue, in, in proactively uh, talking things. Sometimes we lack appropriate knowledge. Sometimes many of us are introvert by nature. It is not so easy for us to just go out. We have language barrier and so on and so forth. And all these things make us very feel very inadequate to share the gospel like these missionaries that we hear. And this thing end up feeling guilty about our lack of evangelistic zeal. It makes us feel guilty. So the prompt, the, so the, the thought is, surely there has to be a way where we can, uh, as a church, as a group of ordinary people, sent out to announce and demonstrate the reign of God through Christ without expecting ourselves to be something we are not. That means the very self who we are or something less than we should be. That means who we are and what characteristics or what personality we have. And I believe the key to do that is to equip the believers to see themselves as the sent ones. As God has sent Christ, Christ has sent his disciple and he's sending us. We have to equip our believers, our brethren to see as themselves as the sent out and to foster a series of missional habits. What do they do? These habits, the habits shape and shape our lives. They give values and they help us to propel into the world confidently with hope. And this is my aim throughout the series of sermons to share with you some habits that would equip all of us to live or rather propel outward with the power and equipment, equipping of the Holy Spirit. Now to do that, we first need to understand what is the biblical model of missions because we have seen different churches using different things. So what is that? Now this author, Michael Frost, he is the author of the book, Surprise the World with the Five Habits of Highly Missional People, whose book also we will be referring in this series. He defines the biblical model as follows. He says, evangelistic mission works effectively when we are living generous, hospitable, spirit-led, Christ-like lives as missionaries to our own neighborhood. And when the gifted evangelists in our midst join us in sharing Christ with our neighbors. He is saying this is not just an evangel evangelism strategy, but this is a very biblical model. Now, how is he basing this biblical model? Of course, he is basing this biblical model based on Apostle Paul twofold approach to evangelism. Now, Apostle Paul, he affirms the gifting of evangelist. Interestingly, it's not evangelism, but evangelist herself as a gift. In, we see uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. 
and then he write as though all the believers are to be evangelistic in our general orientation orientation means what we do how we do where we do we have to be evangelistic in nature so now apostle paul is clearly putting himself in the first category that is seeing himself seeing his ministry not only as that of an apostle a sent out but also as the one of an evangelist <clears throat> but it doesn't be, uh, appear that apostle paul wanted all the christians to bear the responsibility of bold proclamation or to be an evangelist now how do we derive that we derive that from his uh, letter to the colossians what he says devote yourself to pray being watchful and thankful this is to the church in colossians then he says pray for us too that god may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the ministry of christ for which i am in chain <laughs> Okay? And then he continued to ask them to pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And then what does he ask the Colossians to do? Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Orientation. Make the most of every opportunity. Orientation. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. That is, when the living water flow out of you, it will generate curiosity. It will raise questions for people to ask. So for evangelistic, like Paul, ask for the opportunity to share Christ and for the courage to proclaim the gospel. That we see it in verse 3 and 4. But he doesn't suggest the Colossians to pray as much as he asked for Colossians to pray for him. So the evangelistic believers are to pray for the evangelism ministry and they ask themselves to be wise in their conduct towards outsiders and to look for opportunities. Now when it comes to the spoken aspect of this uh, ministry, the evangelists are supposed to proclaim and we believers are to give answers through the questions or the, uh, the the curiosity that is raised by our lifestyle. So while evangelism is an essential gifting for all the churches, while evangelism is an essential gifting for all the churches, it isn't gifting given to every believer. It isn't gifting given to all the believers. And, and, and wait as I expound on this statement. Now, believers, as Apostle Paul says, as noted, we are to pray like crazy and to conduct ourselves in word and deed in such a way as to provoke unbelievers to question their belief and enter into an evangelistic dialogue. And on this part, Peter is also with Apostle Paul, as he says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 to 16, as Lena has helped us to read. And Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So, in other words, the model is for the leaders to identify, equip, and mobilize the gifted evangelist. Sometimes this evangelist take the leadership position in our church's uh, outreach ministry. Okay, So leaders are what to do? They have to identify, equip and mobilize the gifted evangelist and then inspire all the believers to live a questionable life. That means if all the believers are leading this kind of life, and invoke questions from their friends, then opportunities for sharing faith abound. And chances for the gifted evangelists to boldly proclaim are increased. In short, our task is to surprise the world through our lifestyle. Okay? 
Now, these gifted evangelist leaders, they bear the responsibility to equip the congregation to be able to tell others about Jesus. These leaders, they equip the congregation of how to uh, tell others about Jesus. But always remember, the opportunities for faith sharing will always emerge from those questioning unbelievers. It's always from them. Okay. Now, these gifted evangelists, they should train the congregation to speak about Jesus conversationally whenever a question that arises. People would ask you, how do you deal with suffering? How do you deal with loss? How do you deal with failure differently than the way the rest of us do? How do you use your free, your free time rather than doing your hobby and doing something you love? You're spending the time to help others, to, to stand with poor. How have you opened the door for strangers when we don't have time for ourselves? So these are the questions when we will live the life, it will raise, it, it will raise the unbelievers' question, questions. And let me give you one real life example how it changed the entire Roman Empire in the 4th century. Now this twofold approach literally transformed the entire Roman Empire. When the evangelists and apologists such as Peter and Paul were proclaiming the gospel and defending its integrity in the era of polytheism and pagan superstition, hundreds and thousands of ordinary believers like you and me were in, uh, infiltrating in every aspect of society and living the kind of questionable life that evoked curiosity about the very Christian message. They surprised the empire with their very unlikely lifestyle. Now, what did these ordinary believers they do? They devoted themselves to the sacrificial acts of kindness. They loved their enemies. They forgive their persecutors. They cared for the poor and fed the hungry. And remember, in the brutality of life under Roman rule, they were the most stunning they were the most stunningly different people anyone had ever seen during their time. Indeed, their influence was so surprisingly that the 4th century Emperor Julian, who ruled between AD 331 to 363, he feared that these Christians, whom he referred as Galileans, would take over the entire nation by their act of philanthropy. And he was so concerned that he, he gave order to his uh, staff to outdo Christians in loving, caring the people. He decreed that a system of food distribution be started and hostel be built to take care of poor travelers and so on and so forth. But all his effort failed because he failed to realize that the Christians are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And they had that love which was motivated by the grace, which he didn't have. He had only action. We had a motivation. The message that this ordinary Christian saved that God loved the world was very absurd for the average Roman was because for their God, their pagan gods, they hardly cared about humankind. And yet in their miserable world of the Roman Empire, these Christians not only proclaimed the mercy of God, but they also demonstrated it. They not only fed the poor, but they welcome all comers, regarding of their socio-economic status. All are welcome. Let's come in fellowship. The nobleman embraced the slave at that time, where there was such a big difference between slave and their masters. You see, they were literally the most surprising alternative society and their conduct raised an unquenchable curiosity among the average Roman citizen. 
and now you can see how the proclamation of gifted uh, evangelist would have been far more effective among such a society of people living such a questionable life and i think this is what apostle paul was referring to when he says adorn the gospel or in our contemporary language you can say make the gospel attractive now just take a pause and look around are we not living as in a similar society as the romans were with restriction division self centeredness now if the believers then can shake the entire nation can we not do the same here in the same way i think the answer is yes Paul insists that we Christian live this way in order to make the teaching of the church attractive. Now imagine in the first century nothing can be more questionable than a slave who loved his master or a self-controlled man or a woman who didn't engage in slander. In other word this was Paul's recipe for a questionable life in his time. and my dear family our challenge is to find similarly questionable lives what questionable life it looks like in our 21st century what kind of life in today's time would evoke questions what kind of life that you and i should live you see there is an old saying Uh, it's it's a communication theory that goes like this when predictability is high the impact is low in other word when the audience know what you are going to say or what you are going to do and you go on doing it the impact is low but when you go on doing something which the audience has not expected it will create a long lasting impact on them now remember see <clears throat> the same goes out the same principle goes out for our outreach one of the primary act of the evangelistic believer also to arouse the curiosity among the unbelievers leading the questions and faith sharing now the act of philanthropy that is the christians today going out and helping is right rather quite common right today the society expect the churches to help the needy today the society expect the christians to do the to do uh, to stand for others now i'm not saying that the the impact the so it's rather more predictable for what we would do i'm not saying we should not do those thing we should continue to exhibit kingdom values but i think we need to take a different approach we need to surprise the world that has a longer lasting impact so <clears throat> here is the problem or the challenge that we are facing in our time that the very relational god who has created the humanity as relational in his own image today lacks the very relational aspect and the society today is devoid of it the world has become so self centric so selfish that everyone is only worried about them their success their life their happiness that they don't have a time for anybody else and that is an our opportunity to fulfill the evangelistic mandate that paul and peter has given us to present gospel we need to propel the outside into the lives of our neighbors more than just doing charity work it needs us to involve into their life more deeper and we need to rely on jesus more intimately and so we need to become more godly first that is our vertical relationship we need to be more relational in this less and less relational world we need to be more interesting in other people's life we need to be socially adventurous we need to take a step out and we need to share our joyous presence in the life of others and that takes us to the next thing that 
how do I live a questionable life? And I would like to divide this into two parts. Who are my neighbors whom I need to propel outside? And how do I live a questionable life? And to answer the first is this, I created this small sphere of influence. You will not see, but I will talk about it. This is also something that Shanti has done in one of the activities during the convention. Now you see those small boxes around me on the left and right side are the people with whom I regularly come in touch. On my right side are the people, uh, the cook that comes, the maid, her family, uh, the, the grocery shops I visit, the vegetable shop I visit, my neighbors, the people who sweep the street, the trash collector that I come across, the saloon that I go and the boys that I meet, my colleagues, remote colleagues, my immediate local colleagues, uh, the, the local church that we go is in the school, so the administration staff. My friends and relatives who are not Christians, their families. You see, this is my sphere of influence on whom I can share my life, which can create their curiosity, which can increase their curiosity and ask questions. And I would like you to work, go home and create your sphere of influence and see where you can go and propel outside into whose life. These are your neighbors. So how do I live a questionable life? So we don't have to look anywhere else. We have to look Jesus and what he has done. And now why do we look at Jesus? Because we don't want to encourage a man-made practice or principle, but we want to go and see. Now, of course, I have crossed my 22 minutes. So I'll just quickly do one or two rest up, uh, uh, practical aspects I'll share you on the WhatsApp group. The very first and foremost thing that you can go and propel outside is love. The very agape love that God has given and the very self-giving love that he has taught us. What did Jesus thought? Jesus thought that love is the greatest commandment. In Matthew 22, 37 to 40, he summarized the law by saying, love your Lord Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love the neighbor as yourself. He emphasized that love is the very foundation of the kingdom and called his followers to love their enemies. How Jesus loved it? He lived this principle. He demonstrated the very sacrificial love through his compassion for the marginalized, the healing of the sick and ultimately through his death on the cross. He lived the very self-giving love. He showed the very agape love that who he is. How we can demonstrate? I think we need to show that unconditional love to others. Even when it is hard. Can you do that? Even when you know that somebody has hurt me. Can I go out and show my love? Can I go out and show my kindness? Even though I know it will hurt. Can you do that sacrificial step? Out of love for your neighbor. Can you take out a time from your personal life, from your most successful, lucrative career and go out and take care of others? Just be with those people who need it. Can you spend a little more time with the security guard whom you just passed in the office or in your building? Spend some time to know him. Can, you, can we do that? Now, can we forgive those who have wronged us? I know we, all of us have people who have hurt us and hurt us to the level that it hurt to the core. That eats us. Can we ask God to heal us and give us a strength to forgive those? As Jesus is continuously forgiving us, despite we go away from him, he keeps loving us. Can we do that? Can we forgive others who have wronged us? I had personally a lot of challenge to forgive some of those people whom I worked or in my life. But I prayed and I said, God, it is eating me more than it should help me. So help, first of all, forgive me and help me to forgive others so that I don't let myself be trapped by the very power of devil on these things. Liberate me. Can we do that? 
can we do that of course this uh, humanity and servitude i will share with you i just want to do peacekeeping okay last one what did he, jesus taught he called us to be the followers to be peacemakers of course we have our views we get hurt we stand strong but are we as a vessel of honor as pastor dana said instead of being quarrelsome can we become a peacemaker how did jesus live it he came to this very earth to bring peace between humanity and god he also showed peace by refusing to retaliate or escalate conflict even when he was falsely accused or mistreated how we can live can you and i promote reconciliation in broken relationship within ourselves within our neighbors with our colleagues with whom we work with whom we have a very deep friendship with can we seek to resolve conflict with the help of the holy spirit in humility and can we continue to keep praying for peace in our society as we conclude by living this kingdom values authentically and consistently our lives become a testimony of the transformative power of god transformative power of the gospel as peter writes always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who ask you the reason for hope that you have and when people see the love when people see the peace and compassion and the trust we embody they are naturally they will be naturally drawn to ask it about the source of this qualities because my dear family the world lacks it and this will give us an opportunity to share the good news of jesus so in essence living out this kingdom values turns our everyday action into a powerful witness of the transformative power and love of christ so what what we should do let us then go out as a group of ordinary people sent out to announce and demonstrate the very reign of god through christ by the spirit 